happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery. Today's episode is about one of the original internet sleuths and the tent girl. It's May 17th, 1968, and when water well digger Wilbur Riddle arrived at his work site on US Route 25 near Georgetown, Kentucky, he found a note from his boss asking him to wait to start his work until the man arrived. With nothing to do, Wilbur started to wander around when he noticed telephone workers replacing glass insulators. Wilbur had a friend who liked to sell them as paperweights, so he walked over to dig through their castoffs. As he searched the ground for the old-style insulators, he found a bundled green tarp tied with a rope. Curious, he pushed it with his foot, causing some of the bundle to unwrap and roll down a short hill. As it did, the smell of decay assaulted his senses, and Wilbur could make out the shape of a human body. In a panic, he ran to the nearest phone and called the local sheriff's office. When the sheriff and deputies arrived, they cut away the rope that bound the bundle and found the nude body of what appeared to be a badly decomposing female. She had a towel on one of her shoulders. An autopsy would show that their victim was a white female who was 16 to 19 years old. She stood five foot one inch tall, weighed around 112 pounds, and had short reddish brown hair with a noticeable gap between her front teeth. A spot of slight discolorization on her skull hinted at the cause of her death, but no formal conclusion could be made. Investigators theorized that their Jane Doe had been knocked unconscious and then wrapped in the tarp where she suffocated. At the crime scene itself, investigators didn't have much to work with, but the tarp that Jane Doe was covered in. They soon found that these tarps were the kind used to cover and store carnival tents. Although different carnivals in the area were checked, this lead didn't pan out. Police issued appeals to families with missing family members, asking them to please come forward and contact the police. A composite sketch was made showing the gap in Jane Doe's teeth. This turned up many leads that, again, led nowhere, as the drawing seemed to resemble everyone's missing daughter. The media dubbed their Jane Doe Tent Girl. Fingerprints were taken from the young woman, but no match could be found. The green tarp, rope, and towel that had been lying on one of her shoulders were sent to the FBI's lab to be tested. Everything seemed to be commonly made and was widely distributed. The only thing that they could offer was that the towel found on one of the woman's shoulders was in fact a baby's burp cloth, which is used by parents when burping a baby. Some of the tips called into authorities were tracked down and seemed close to being their match, but none would turn out to be Tent Girl. Three years later, they still didn't know who she was and decided it was time to give her a final resting place. Because of her state of decomposition, Tent Girl was unable to be embalmed. She was buried in a cemetery near Georgetown. Her headstone included her police sketch and vital statistics, turning this young life into little more than a small collection of facts. Tent Girl, found May 17, 1968 on U.S. Highway 25 North, died about April 26th to May 3rd, 1968, age about 16 to 19 years, height 5 feet 1 inch, weight 110 to 115 pounds, reddish brown hair, unidentified. Years would pass, and in 1987, Wilbur Riddle had still not forgotten about Tent Girl. He had often talked with his family about her and wondered if she would ever be identified. Now, with a 17-year-old daughter of his own, Wilbur had a better frame of reference to understand the loss that Tent Girl's family had experienced. Near Halloween that year, Wilbur's daughter, Lori, sat with her friends as they tried to frighten each other with scary stories. Lori told the group about her father and Tent Girl. One person in the group, Lori's friend, Todd Matthews, was particularly interested in her story. Not only did he find the tale strange, but he was struck by the fact that a teenager could be killed and left for dead and her family not know anything about it. Within a year, Lori and Todd were married, but Todd couldn't quit thinking about the Jane Doe. 
Anytime the couple traveled from their home in Tennessee to the Riddle families in Kentucky, Todd would visit Tent Girl's grave and her crime scene. Having access to one of the original witnesses, Todd would question and re-question his father-in-law about the discovery. Soon, Todd's fascination with Tent Girl would even put a strain on his life. Quote, I don't want to say I was dangerously obsessed, but I was very into that case. I'd determined I'm going to try to find her family. Todd spent nights and weekends scouring missing persons reports, and he visited local newspapers to view their articles from the period, trying to track down new details or clues. Over a 10-year period, he spent thousands of dollars and interviewed people by both telephone and in person while the search itself put a strain on his marriage. He was still unable to find Tent Girl's family. And then came the internet. In November of 1997, Todd created the website tentgirl.com, hoping that her family would see it and contact him. When that didn't happen, he started searching other websites that offered information on missing people, some looking for their loved ones as well. In January of 1998, he found the following listing. My sister Barbara has been missing from our family since the latter part of 1967. She has brown hair, brown eyes, is about 5 feet 2 inches tall, and was last seen in the Lexington, Kentucky area. If you have any information, please contact me at the address posted. The address was for Rosemary Westbrook of Benton, Arkansas. Her sister's name was Barbara Ann Taylor, or Bobby to loved ones. Lexington is about 13 miles from Georgetown, where a tent girl was found. I did what we shouldn't do, Todd admitted. I made a cold call to the family. After talking with Rosemary, he also learned that Bobby had a prominent gap between her teeth as well. Feeling his journey might be close to an end, Todd opened contact between Rosemary and the medical examiner in Kentucky who was handling Tent Girl's case. They agreed that the newly emerging science of DNA testing could help them. On March 2, 1998, Tent Girl was exhumed, and samples of her bones and teeth were extracted for testing against a cheek swab given by Rosemary. Their results showed conclusively that the two women were sisters, and that Tent Girl was in fact Barbara, or Bobby, Ann Taylor. Even though the family was close to receiving closure on a 30-year mystery, they still didn't know who had killed her or why. In 1967, Bobby was 24 and a mother of two girls and one boy, seven-year-old Bonnie, eight-month-old Shelly, and three-year-old Sonny. She and her husband, George Earl Taylor, lived in Lexington, Kentucky, where he worked as a traveling carnival worker. Friends and family who knew the man as Earl recall that he was violent and often impulsive. Investigators believe that Earl killed Bobby over an argument, striking her in the head to render her unconscious, then wrapping and tying her body up in the tarp and dumping it, leaving her to suffocate. Her body was found near a highway that leads to Ohio, where Earl's family lived. Bonnie remembers that after an argument one night, she awoke the next morning to find her mother gone. That day, Earl loaded the family up and took them to his family in Warden, Ohio, where he dropped them off and didn't return for two years. The green tarp she was wrapped in was something Earl could easily obtain from work. In late 1967, Bobby's family finally tracked Earl down, but they were told that she had left him for another man, and he refused to tell them where the children were. After that, they never heard from Bobby again. Everyone involved now hoped that Bobby's killer would be brought to justice, but those hopes would be dashed when they learned that Earl had died in October of 1987 of cancer. He was never officially implicated, but he is believed to have been her killer. Bobby was then buried again in the Georgetown Cemetery, but this time her family, friends, and Todd Matthews attended. A stone section was added to the bottom of her original grave marker. On it, they removed her married name and replaced it with her maiden name of Hackman. It now reads, Bobby Barbara Ann Hackman, September 12, 1976 to December 6, 1967, loving mother, grandmother, and sister. Case Cracked. 
I would like to thank CBS News, The Huffington Post, AngelFire.com, NBCPhiladelphia.com, FindAGrave.com, and Wired. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is now to talk to us about it. So, Christy, uh, of course, for any longtime fans of the channel, you've probably heard me talk about Todd Matthews before, but just mm -hmm. in case you haven't, uh, Todd Matthews would actually wind up not just working with NamUs, but he was actually a consultant in the build out of NamUs. The Department of Justice effectively reached out to him because of his work on cases like this. And he was really kind of becoming an advocate for uh, Doe cases and missing persons cases. Uh, in 2016, I got in touch with Todd and he has always been extremely helpful. Uh, the kind of person where, you know, I would, I could send him an email and literally that same day, sometimes within an hour or two, uh, he'd be replying and not just that, but I remember one case in particular where I sent him a missing persons poster and I was like, Todd, I'm not seeing a record for this in NamUs. Uh, he saw it and he's like, oh, I'll, don't worry about it. I'll get it done tonight. You know, and just, just took it on. This is a guy that's just, he's, he's motivated to help these cases in an amazing way. Mm -hmm. Um, and in 2016, when we started talking, he was really working on um, state bills that were going to mandate NamUs entry. And he was just starting to have success with that. They were starting to get some of those states to kick those bills into action, forcing law enforcement that if, if you have a case of this nature, you have to enter it into NamUs. And that has just been growing ever since. Then he left NamUs. And unfortunately, I only had contact information for him there. But, uh, you know, after Christy sent the script here, I was like, you know what? I wonder if I could use my little internet sleuth skills and try to find Todd. And it took like five minutes. Uh, he is on Twitter. And if you guys want to follow him, you can follow him mm -hmm. at Unforgotten. Of course, not just NamUs. He's also responsible for another great organization. Christy, tell us about it. Yeah, he's a pretty amazing person. Mm hmm well, once the tent girl mystery was solved, he just couldn't forget about the other missing persons cases out there. You know, I mean, he even said, I thought we sent this one home, maybe just one more or two more. He really felt that he could help these people. So while he continued to work at his factory job in his spare time, he continued to work with other people. He contributed to the development of the Doe Network, which, as we know, is an online network of volunteers who assist investigators with missing persons and unidentified remains on three different continents. Yeah. But that wasn't all that he did. And this one I, I really liked too. He also assisted in the formation of Eden, which stands for everyone deserves a name. Now, Eden is a group of certified forensic artists who volunteer voluntarily create composite sketches and clay reconstructions of unidentified remains to aid law enforcement. I think that is just the neatest thing. Yeah, and he, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's interesting to see something that was kind of a, a passion for him that really pulled him in. I mean, to the point where, you know, like he, his marriage was, was getting strained by it. Um, I know. But for him to hit a conclusion with that case and then all of a sudden say, you know what, I, I can't stop here. I, you know, I gotta, I gotta do this again. We gotta see if we can bring other people back their names. Uh, it's just, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. It is. It is. And I know his his father-in-law had no idea that it would end up that way. He said, I'm not sure my father-in-law knew the impact of the identification of Tent Girl in my life. It was creating a second identity for me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for this being kind of one of the earliest, you know, Internet solves on a case of this nature, uh, mm -hmm. a problem that comes up. And I try to mention this whenever we do coverage on Doe cases here on the channel is because of the state of the remains, sometimes determining age in particular can mm -hmm. be really, really tough. And it's um, because of how people, they want to kind of do the same thing Todd did. And and that's kind of what NamUs is built for. Missing person records on one side, unidentified bodies on the other. If the information is solid enough on both, you can match those up and make those connections and, and find those people. Mm -hmm. But when you have instances, not just with age discrepancies because you might have you know this doctor thinks that that is a 13 year old and then like in this case you know we find out she's actually much older than than the teenage range um 
there's also challenges with weight, with height. Sometimes you'll see that there'll be really wide ranges in like determining the height because once mm -hmm. again of, of the decomposition or, or the pieces that might be missing while they're making that profile. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting and it, it's a tough thing. I don't know that that ever gets perfect but thanks to you know dna analysis and and kind of the newer technologies that they're using for matching these cases up that's that's helping thank goodness because that was unfortunate you yeah. know the age range was off just enough and especially knowing that that was a baby's burp cloth i think knowing a mother with a baby would have jogged memories better than what they had to work with it's yeah that's that's a good point and not to mention nowadays like if if you had that same instance happen you might go to the national center for missing and exploited children and go through their data looking for the match but that's then, very true knowing it's a 24 year old they're outside of that bracket so that data set wouldn't even have the person that you're looking for so yeah it's a, yeah. It's a constant challenge with cases like these but uh looks like todd was on the the right track and it's really interesting for him to bring this up in particular because I think this is something that it, it comes up pretty regularly in the social media true crime space. And it's something that I know I'm feeling more passionate and particular about over the past year. But the quote that he said, mm -hmm. we're talking about he's one of the original Internet detectives there. And, the, and you can see that, you know, I, I've talked about how how imperfect this whole thing is. You make mistakes, you learn from it, you change your process. Right from the start, he says, I made a cold call to the, I did something I shouldn't do. I made a cold call to the family. Yeah. Um, and it's nowadays with social media, it's so easy to reach out to those families that I think it's really important that we have to remember that we need to be contributing something significant to to be helping those families. And in this case, you know, Todd believed that. And this is before he was Todd of Doe Network or Todd of NamUs. Um, yeah. You know, this is just a guy that was trying to be helpful and was kind of obsessed about this case. Uh, and it it played out thankfully and opened up a whole different career path for him essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one of those things, you know. There's an aspect for some people that look at this type of media where they can become fans of the media. And I think Todd hit that a little bit with with his interest in the case. Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays, uh, I don't know, guys, I just I want to put the big warning out there because I hear from people that are contacted by people and then they really don't have anything to offer the family or they promise certain things and those things never pan out. Um and it can be hurtful. It could be hurtful because I, I do talk to family members that have been hurt by people that have reached out to them supposedly to help them. Sometimes you even get the help and then it still turns into a problem after that. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, one of those things I just want to caution everyone to, you know, if you're if you're a true crimer and you reach out to a family member because you want to interview them for your, your podcast or something like that, you, you know, you're, you're offering some type of value, some type of, of benefit. But if you're just a general Internet sleuth, there's just a question of, is that the right thing to do? And I, I love that that Todd points this out and learns this so early. Yeah, because the family has to come first, not you or the name you're trying to build. They yeah. have to come first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not just supporting. The other thing is families are always very important sources for telling these stories, for letting us know who the person really is for sometimes giving us conditions around their life that led up to a disappearance. Um, but in terms of actual solves for the case, you know, the family information isn't going to come into play that often. And I think when people start playing in this social media space with true crime and everyone wants to solve a case, right? Everyone wants to say, oh, I solved that case. I think there's this thing that uh, for some people, they think, well, if I can get in touch with the family and, you know, they would give me all the information and then I'd be able to solve this for them. It's it's very, very I mean, think about it. If the family had that level of information, the investigators working for law enforcement would have access to that same information. If the solve is really that simple, it would already be solved. Yeah. Uh, the truth is, for many of these cases that you're seeing uh, on these channels, these are long standing, very deep and hard to solve cases. Um, in most cases, but, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, uh, I really appreciate Todd. And as a matter of fact, 
you guys might be seeing him back on the channel here very, very soon. So stay tuned for that. Christy, as always, thank you so much for all your help on this case. And I'm sorry that I spoke over your whole segment. I don't think you got to say anything here, but I had so much no. to say. <laughs> good points. We're good. It's good points. <laughs> all right. We'll see you back next week. I'll let you talk more then, okay? There we go. But right now I've got some other people to thank. Thank you, PayPal supporters Sigrid E. O'Hearn, Jennifer Dixon, and Angela Welch Sola. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee, like Perlette Toussaint recently did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit SeriouslyMysterious.com and remember to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, please don't forget to hit that bell icon below if you'd like to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.